Amazon's Stockholm HQ was set up over half a decade ago to house their cloud and web services uh, business, AWS. Their marketplace arrived last year in Sweden during the midst of a pandemic. Millions of the population were stuck at home and unable to visit physical storefronts and businesses, leading to the rise in e-commerce this past year. Specifically, Amazon's 63.3% jump in stock value, gaining $570 billion at the end of the year at a value roughly $1.5 trillion, according to a Forbes report. Swedish consumer behavior has proven adaptability with the eldest demographic in the country changing their purchasing habits to online overnight. The majority of Swedish consumers are comfortable with online shopping and the use of the format on a daily basis. With Amazon continuously investing its business and unmoved by failure, every move they make has global impact. An understanding of knowledge economy and navigating through the marketplace is essential to businesses today. In the first webinar, we covered why your business should enter Amazon's marketplace. The second webinar discussed how to launch and what are the cornerstones of strategy to compete. Today, we will be discussing Amazon as an international marketplace and where Sweden and the Nordics fit into the bigger picture. We'll take a few short breaks for questions followed by Q&A at the end of the presentation. I wanna thank our audience for joining us today and encourage you to submit any questions if you have uh, through the Q&A button located at the bottom of the screen. We have allotted plenty of time at the end of today's presentation. So please feel free to submit any questions that come to mind during today's presentation. Here to present Amazon as an internal mar international marketplace, I'd like to welcome Udian Bos, founder and CEO of Net Elixir, who is an expert in, with an e-commerce sphere and will be guiding you through today's topic. Thank you very Udian. much, Nicole. Thank, thank you for the lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, it, it, it's quite phenomenal. This is the third third webinar in this series on Amazon, competing uh, with and on Amazon. And uh, I, I must say that I, we have really been overwhelmed with the positive response that we have received from the audience. So thank you very much. I know many of you are, this is your third webinar in succession. So we really appreciate your attending the webinars and passing on and sharing on the love. So really appreciate it. Uh, a little bit about Netelixir. Uh, what we do, we are a digital marketing firm. Uh, we are headquartered in Princeton, New Jersey, and uh, we have offices in Hyderabad, India. And we are, uh, our newest office in Stockholm is someone, something that we are extremely excited about. As a company, we help e-commerce brands find and engage high-value shoppers and acquire game-changing insights. We work with a wide range of clients, uh, mostly in the in the retail industry, quite a little, and and the D two C industry, uh, a little bit in the B two B, but mostly it is B two B two B B two C and uh, retail, uh, primarily on the e commerce side. Uh, we are a customer technology partner for UPS. We are also one of the top ten independent agencies for both Google as well as Microsoft in the US, and uh, we are very excited to be a redeal partner. Uh, here in Sweden, which actually is our first partnership in the Swedish market. We offer a wide range of solutions. We call them the e-commerce growth solutions, starting with working very closely with businesses to craft their digital marketing strategy, managing their growth marketing channels, which includes paid search and shopping, which is on Google ads, uh, et cetera, social media marketing, uh, Amazon marketing services. It's not there still in the Swedish market, but we do a fair amount uh, in other markets like the United States and UK. Uh, search engine optimization, we do a lot of web analytics consulting. And last but not the least, we do a fair amount of e-commerce development as well. Uh, so today's topic uh, has obviously a lot of interest, primarily because with Amazon's launch in Sweden in 2020, uh, understandably, it really opened up a wide, wide, huge opportunity for a lot of businesses to go ahead and really sell to other, other markets outside of Sweden itself. So I really will start with some of the benefits which uh, this, uh, the, the Amazon's entry in Sweden really provides to a lot of the local businesses or to the EU seller. Uh, the first and foremost, understandably, you really now gain access to multiple EU markets. If you have an EU selling account, you essentially can sell in multiple marketplaces from a single account. 
And that's, I think, a big, big advantage because if you just think of doing the same thing using your own website, you understandably have to have to really sort of check a lot of the logistical hassles and a lot of the challenges which Amazon is sort of removing from your plate. The other advantage we obviously have, or you obviously have as a uh, as a EU Amazon EU seller, uh, essentially you have obviously access to a, a wide range of uh, 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 a, a much more diverse population who can be really called as a potential or addressable customer base as well. Uh, the second part, the second bullet that I have is very interesting. So we work with uh, a large number of clients and really help them with their Amazon, Amazon listing and Amazon searches. And one of our observations uh, as we were really trying to differentiate between us to what is the difference in the consumer behavior or the shopper behavior in the the UK market or the Germany market and the, the US market, one of the very interesting things that we really identified was uh, the shoppers in the US are more likely to use a brand plus product searches on Amazon. So it is, for example, like, let us say, a, a, a particular Adidas plus running shoes or Skechers plus walking shoes, some, some, something of that sort. So the brand was more likely to be mentioned. While if you really go into uh, UK and Germany, we felt, we saw that uh, the shoppers were using non-brand product searches. So they were not really adding on a brand. So as we really reflect on just this very small, but in our opinion, very powerful insight, this shows that the, the shopper on Amazon in the European market, they may be a lot more open in terms of really looking at as to what brands are available there uh, on Amazon. They are much more focused on the product category or category of choice rather than essentially getting uh, to start with a particular brand which in our opinion is a massive advantage. It's a massive advantage primarily because if the shopper is does not really come with a very preconceived mindset that I really have to buy just this brand, then it really op offers a tremendous opportunity for even lesser known brands as well to sell to a much bigger shopper group across the various countries as well. Uh, so let us say we have a Swedish local brand which wants to expand into the Nordics. Let us say they want to also send it selling probably Denmark and Norway. So there may be an opportunity for the, the local Swedish brands, as well as the D2C brands as well, primarily, to go ahead and expand into the other markets and really get visible and get seen, which I think is a, uh, I think is a pretty substantial advantage that, that, that uh, uh, this particular insight can really provide to you. The third one, uh, it, Amazon Sweden site is likely to be the gateway to the entire Nordics. Uh, if you really look at it prior to the launch of the Swedish site, most of the shoppers in the European market, primarily in the Nordics, were probably either buying from the Netherlands site or maybe the Germany site. But in this case, with the launch of the Swedish site, they can now have better delivery speed. They can have a greater ease of product returns as well. And also there are certain price advantages which are really likely to sort of come up as well. So understandably, you suddenly have a, access to a much bigger Nordics market as well. And that again is a needless to mention is a big advantage for the local Swedish businesses. So moving on to some of the challenges. So while on one hand, every business really needs to understand and evaluate what are the, what are the positives. On the other hand, you really have to have to be, be very clearly focused on as to what can potentially be some of the challenges be as well. The first one obviously is suddenly you have a lot more competition from the European sellers. The Amazon EU seller in Germany or UK or other European markets essentially now has a lot easier access to the Swedish market and that they already have. So again, the, the fact is, even though it is a challenge, uh, that's, that's how it is going to be. So the Swedish businesses really have to, have to be ready for this competitor, uh, the, the, the competitive intensity increasing quite substantially and really go ahead and face the competition. The second one, what we have seen normally, I mean, since we work with, as I mentioned, quite a few Amazon sellers in Europe, we have seen that for specific on a skew level, there are impacts on margins in the product life cycle as well. When I say impacts on margin in the sense, when you really introduce us or start selling a unique product on Amazon, probably you are selling it for $100, so, right? Just, just 100 euros as, as an example, right? But we have seen that there are lower price competitors which tend to come in fairly, fairly quickly, I would think within a span of about four to six weeks. And this is, I think, across consistent across categories. As a result of which, there is a greater squeeze on your margin. And also the, 
So that's where I think there is a constant product innovation requirement, which any Amazon seller really faces. The second part is they really need to select what products will they will they go ahead and promote on Amazon or sell on Amazon. And we had we had referred a, a strategic model where we have been very insistent as to Amazon should be a part of your tactical plan, not really a strategy. And how can you really look at your overall e-commerce market and your overall e-commerce ambitions in a holistic manner rather than focusing only on Amazon or only on your website and so on. The second part is also interesting. If sometimes, and uh, we are seeing it with a couple of our customers in the US market, uh, uh, and we, we see because of the, the launch of competitive products, certain times the, the product lifetime on Amazon can be shorter, uh, can, 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 can get shortened as well. So something to sort of keep note of as well. But again, I mean, the, the way to combat both of these is through product innovation and constantly doing a lot of research and finding out all of the consumer data that you can really get, uh, identifying as to what are the keyword searches that people are doing, et cetera, so that you are able to constantly keep moving. So don't take Amazon as a static marketplace, take it as a dynamic marketplace, which really compels you or forces you to keep on innovating and which innovation is a good thing for business anyway. And the last part is, uh, this is a strategy if you really track overall Amazon's entry into the new market, any new market. I think uh, one of the things which is becoming pretty clear or two of the things which are becoming pretty clear, the first part is uh, the possibility of a, of a partnership with a local player uh, or maybe an, even an acquisition. For example, in the US, uh, I'm pretty sure many of you are aware that Whole Foods was acquired by Amazon. So the concept of using Whole Food distribution as potentially a distribution center or something wherein the transactions can be made, I think is an interesting concept as well. And which we are seeing gives a tremendous level of offline and online connectivity to Amazon's entire business, which is a big, big strength because you, are, you suddenly have an access to a distribution network altogether. And similarly for Monopri in France, they are essentially, it is, Amazon has partnered with them and effectively, that again is one of the one of the simple examples with this as well. Uh, the other insight that we have, if you really track back, I think it has been fairly clearly proven uh, in uh, for any e-commerce or any retail e-commerce segment, grocery is the thing, right? So if you really are able to get a control on grocery business and really sort of use grocery as a almost like a lead-in factor, uh, the possibility of your expanding a lot quicker sort of goes up substantially. So we would, we would not be surprised if Amazon Fresh or Amazon's grocery business is launched fairly quickly in the Swedish market as well. Now, understandably, when, when Amazon is partnering with a local chain, let us say, as a distribution partner, like let us say, uh, Monopri in France, understandably, it may also, to an extent, tilt or skew or probably create a bit of an imbalance in terms of the, the, the traditional balance of power in the Swedish market as well. Right. So effectively, let us say you are in consumer electronics industry, you have one leading player and there is a distant number two. If Amazon decides to partner with number two for distribution, expanding the distribution, we have seen that there is a shift in the overall power equation in terms of the cloud, the, the overall selling cloud that you have in the traditional business as well. As Nicole mentioned earlier, I really wanted to capture. So I think when we, we have talked now, this is the third webinar we have done in terms of what is the impact of Amazon and how big this can be. One of the things which we would, we would strongly urge all of you to do is when you really think of the entry of Amazon, unlike probably any other smaller retailer, and probably most of the retailers are smaller than Amazon, uh, essentially it does not really have so many different implications uh, or impact on different aspects of the business for a business, right? So it's very important for you to really map out and at least be aware of all of these changes, which potentially can, uh, which in some way or the other impact your business as well. I would again sort of love to answer any questions at the end, but let me move on to the second part uh, just with this statement. So in Amazon marketplace, despite all of this stuff, there are obviously pros and cons. Now the marketplace is already there, right? And there are businesses, there are competitors of yours who are already going ahead and selling in marketplaces. And the competitors are not only local, they are also coming from other markets in EU as well. So you will need to be a part of your, Amazon marketplace will need to be a part of your brand's omnichannel strategic plan. How you make the Amazon a part of your plan is the key. We sort of, if, if, if there was one takeaway that we would really emphasize 
in this entire three webinar series, that would pretty much be it. I mean, you really have to figure out as to where Amazon sort of plays a part and how exactly you can tap into the enormous distribution cloud of Amazon to go ahead and expand your presence, but do it being mindful of the other factors as well, which can potentially, because as a marketplace, it is an open, uh, overall, an open ecosystem. And in an open ecosystem, it's really very, very difficult to, uh, to really, in certain cases, even govern all the different factors, which, which essentially are an outcome of the open ecosystem as well. So that's where I think uh, we, would, we would very strongly urge. But for those of you who are also interested in balancing the Amazon marketplace presence also with having your own website, there are a lot of solutions available. In fact, we for all of the customers for whom we are managing their Amazon marketplace presence in EU, we also do their search advertising as well. And Google offers a lot of options. Uh, Facebook offers a lot of options as well in terms of how can you really sort of go ahead and target target the market and really grow your business. Understandably, there are it, it's not really a like to like comparison. Uh, Google is trying to get there with shoppable ads, etc. But I think there is still a gap. But having said that, it is useful to be to be at least sort of put a serious thought in terms of if you are rather than selling only on Amazon Marketplace, which gives you global coverage, why not really take your take your business and your website international as well. So with that, I wanted to present to you for those of you who are interested in entering the international markets, or other markets in EU, I wanted to present a strategic model which we have used with tremendous success for many of our clients. Uh, the model that I am talking about is a cultural dimension model, which was referred or recommended by Professor Gert Hofstede. So effectively, I mean, he defines culture is the collective programming of the mind, which really distinguishes the members of one group from the other. So we are talking about, when you talk about the entire digital marketing, it is, it is very clearly and directly intertwined or linked with the collective programming of minds and different cultures as well. So we are at Netflix a massive, massive pro proponent of what we call the globalization model. The globalization essentially is global plus localization. So while you have global aspirations and plans, there are certain parts of your business model which can very easily lead to the global expansion. But you have to always remember that as you get into different countries, you are trying to engage and interact with different shoppers in different cultures. And that is where the localization aspect is extremely, extremely important. So I'll just start with, a, uh, with an example. And I got this, the, this set of wonderful graphics, which was posted by a gentleman on Google. So typically, if you really look at way of life, just to understand what uh, help you understand what I really mean by culture. For example, in blue, you have probably a Swedish a, a, a person or maybe a German person and so on, right? It's a way of life is, uh, is pretty independent individual. While on the right, you have essentially some East Asian countries, uh, probably China, Korea, uh, et cetera. It, it's a very collective way of life uh, in the East Asian countries. If you really look at opinions as well, I mean, for example, it's, it's pretty direct in let us say the Scandinavian countries or Germany or Netherlands and so on. While if you really look at East Asian, sometimes when you, I mean, you really have to uh, make sense of the air around you to really figure out as to what exactly was the real meaning and so on. And the boss of understandably, uh, there is uh, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian countries are a lot more equal in terms of their power distance, while in the East Asian countries, there is very clearly a shift. Uh, so this is, these are all of these extrapolations from the Hofstede model. And what the Hofstede model does it really tries to classify all the countries based on, this was the initial model, it has been extended to seven cultural dimensions now, but we, I'll sort of just, just for brevity sake and focus sake, I'll really focus on the top five cultural dimensions. The first part is power distance. The, the previous slide, which I showed, showed the boss, I think hopefully explains you to understand. The second is masculine versus feminine societies. So feminine societies, uh, let us say Sweden actually is a feminine society, wherein, the work can be done either by uh, a man or a woman, right? So it's it basically exchangeable. It is not that there are certain, certain jobs which can be only done by a man and they cannot be done by a woman. That doesn't exist, right? So those are the feminine countries typically, I mean, just in a very simplistic sense. 
Individualism versus collectivism, I think is pretty straightforward. I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. Uncertainty avoidance is very interesting. And that actually has a ramification in terms of how you really plan your global, global expansion as well. So effectively it is how exactly you are viewing viewing the future and how comfortable are you in terms of chaos and uncertainty as well. So there are certain cultures who uh, who are not comfortable dealing with uncertainty. And there are other cultures who thrive in uncertainty. And this will be sort of figure it out. Similarly, for long-term orientation versus short-term operation, there are some countries who take a long-term strategic view, right? Whatever they are doing now is basically a building block into a long-term. But other countries, they have a very short-term view just because, I mean, for them, what is happening today impacts today and not tomorrow. So those are the things which really need to be kept in mind. And I would, I would, for those of you who are interested in global cultures, I can't really recommend Professor Hofstede's book enough. Uh, it has essentially maps, maps all the different countries. As you can, for example, this is uh, a map for countries in Europe. And as you can see that the power distance, uh, individualism, uncertainty avoidance, it's all ranked effectively in all the countries that he has really sort of mapped in. And there is a particular score which is sort of given for all of this. Why am I mentioning all of this part? I'm mentioning this primarily because it's very important as a marketer or a business, as you are going into the international expansion, whether it be only on Amazon Marketplace or whether it be obviously creating your own website presence and really expanding. It's very important, important to really keep in mind that your culture is different in many cases or likely to be from other cultures. And the success of your marketing program would directly be linked to how, how well you are really able to really localize the content for the, for the new international markets that you really want to get into as well. So let me, let me call upon you, Nicole. You had some very interesting information as well to share. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, yeah, um, some might not know, but uh, I was a trend and consumer analyst uh, for Nordic countries for over 10 years and living in Sweden for well over a decade. And I've made some observations here. So if you look at this uh, OECD cultural map, you'll find that Sweden is on the farthest right, uh, top right, with the most secular self-expression values. And this is in spite of their internal views of having the de facto mainstream global values. Um, historians, Bergren and Tregord accurately describe Swedish cultural behavior and ideology as status individualism, in which society pushes an alliance between the state and the individual. This is, in effect, strengthening personal autonomy. The way I try to illustrate this is using an analogy of an ant colony. So ants don't require ant-to-ant -ant communication, nor do they rely on family or friends. They rely on the colony to function for the individual. So when it comes to trends and consumer behavior, Sweden and the Nordics have the capability of speedy adaptability. In many countries, uh, it tends to be that trends are introduced horizontally and rely on person-to-person -person influence, whereas in Sweden, and in the Nordics, trends are introduced collectively, like a very absorbent sponge being thrown into water, which makes for much faster adaptation and trend sensitivity. If the collective society, and I shouldn't say collective because they're not really like uh, collectivism, but as a society as a whole, if they accept a new trend, the population adopt and adapt. And it's a lot easier to see emerging trends because of this. So I'll, I'll, I'll go back to you uh, on, on, on a little bit about what I've been speaking, but I think that uh, you're onto something with the Hofstede model as well. Thank you so much, Nicole. I have just one question for you, Nicole. I mean, yeah, I mean sure. when we were discussing, you had mentioned about an interesting trend recently in terms of, I think, people uh, so going online as well. And you had some very interesting insight to share when the pandemic struck and let us say senior citizens were mostly at home. You mentioned yeah. that you saw that a, a very fast adoption of online shopping, was it? I mean. Yeah, I, I think that since here that you don't rely on family, uh, senior citizens, they are very independent. They are very individual focused. So when the pandemic occurred, you know, they weren't relying so much on family or other, you know, uh, 
other supports to help them. Uh, instead, they they have adapted extremely fast, ordering their own groceries, ordering necessities online, and having them delivered to their door, or or finding some other uh, function within society so that they can get uh, their needs, their basic needs. Um, and and this is just uh, astonishing when you think about that generation and the how fast they've adapted to digital and online uh, commerce. Hmm. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Thanks. Thank so, <laughs> so I, I think that why are we sort of focusing so much on the concept of localization? So as I mentioned, we are a digital marketing agency. We currently uh, manage campaigns in about 110 countries across the world. And this model, we have really been able to adapt essentially to uh, to even the digital marketing space as well. I'll give you just one simple example, and all of all of you who are attending will be sharing this deck with you as well. Uh, so countries wherein there is, for example, PDI is the, the power distance. Effectively, when there is a big gap, we have seen that when the, when the gap is high, you really need, if you are really doing search advertising, you the, the, the overall keyword phrases that you should be using uh, need to be a lot more long tail and specific keywords. And the reason we probably sort of think that that's happening because when the power distance goes up, uh, typically the society is used to getting told exactly as to what needs to be done. So probably that's an expression of as to why we have found more success using long tail and specific keywords as well. So that's just an, just an example. And we have an entire book. We'll be more than happy to have a separate conversation with you. Uh, about specific countries as well. And we can share this with you also. So feel free to sort of send us questions, uh, et cetera. So we have really, as I mentioned, utilized this very well. And one of the one of the clients that we are working with in Europe, where this globalized approach, this is we we, uh, we are the, the global paid search agency for Lenovo, where it has really worked extremely well. It really can lead to substantially huge impact in terms of, for example, all the European countries we have been able to build very customized localized campaigns uh, across Europe for different countries. And as you can see, the results have been quite astonishing. And we're talking about not a small company. These are, uh, these are for one of the, the number one PC manufacturer in the world, Lenovo. So overall, so if, you, if done well, I think it, it can really sort of yield some extreme dividends as well. So I know we have quite a few attendees today who work for businesses which have interest in sort of going global and going international. We'll be more than happy to have a conversation and share insights about specific countries if you have any questions for us. And I'm pretty sure my colleagues, Jaydeep and Ida can help you with schedule those conversations. So I'll just end with this slide. So effectively, suddenly, let us say, let us say you are a physical store or a chain and you really want to set up and expand to other European countries as well. So we are assuming that you have your own web store. We are also assuming that you have your physical store locations. Now there is the, the, the new marketplace opportunity as well, which is the Amazon marketplace. And as I mentioned, I don't think it's possible for businesses to really ignore Amazon marketplace. You really have to make it a part of your overall, uh, overall positioning and selling and retail strategy. And also you may have some international retail partners as well, or local chains across different countries. The interesting part is, uh, and what we would really want to you to focus on is basically those in the, the intersections of these different circles. Just to uh, explain you as to what I mean, uh, if you're really looking at your web store and your physical store locations, you really have to ensure that you are, you are offering to your customers a unified brand experience. If you're looking at the intersection between physical store locations and Amazon marketplace, the question that I would ask is, is it possible for you to use Amazon as probably almost like a research hub and also in the packaging, I think a fantastic question came up in our last webinar, where there are creative ways of utilizing packaging, et cetera, to incentivize the customer to visit your store and so on. And if you are really looking at the other intersections, it's very important for you to strike a balance. Because in many cases we have seen, uh, and th these experiences are mostly, I must say, confined to the US, we have seen that uh, there is an additional level of sensitivity which is required uh, when you start advertising on Amazon and have your international store presence in terms of managing the channel partnerships and the channel dynamics as well. But the opportunity obviously goes up multiple fold and that, that is really the exciting part in this one. 
So that's what I had in terms of uh, the presentation and the slides. I hope it has been helpful. Uh, let me let me pass it on to the next section uh, where uh, uh, Nicole, if there are any questions, happy to answer them. I know we have probably already have gotten a little stretched on time, but uh, happy to answer any questions we have. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to start with a question from the audience. Um, yeah. The question is, um, speaking of trends uh, and Sweden, aren't Sweden, isn't Sweden viewed as a small America or even small trend-setting countries? Uh, do you think that Sweden will adapt to Amazon before France, for example? Wow, that's a, that's a difficult one, uh, Nicole. And honestly speaking, I, I, I really wish I had the crystal ball. I don't really have the crystal ball. <laughs> But I think there are certain things, as I mentioned, I think if you really look at uh, a simplistic, probably more theoretical way of approaching this is look at that Hofstede score for America and Sweden, and then try to identify as to what are some of the commonalities. And what you would see is, uh, despite our thinking it's similar, there are some massive dissimilarities as well. So those are the things that I think individually you really have to figure out and understand the customer part. And then the second part, in terms of adoption, uh, I would tend to probably skew towards that the likelihood of the Swedish shoppers adopting on and really sort of using Amazon quicker is high or higher than many other European countries, just because the openness of the culture as well. And also the, the tech savvy, or I mean, I don't know whether that's even a right word in today's world, but the tech savvy in Sweden is a lot higher. As Nicole mentioned mm -hmm. that the pandemic has really increased the penetration of online shopping dramatically, right? And it is across the demographic segment as well. So from that perspective, it's very important to understand as to what really Amazon brings to the table. Is this, is this tremendously frictionless, frictionless overall marketing experience or shopping experience? And that is something which in the long run can be tremendous uh, in terms of getting a quicker penetration within the, uh, within the Swedish population, the shopper population. Yeah, I, I mean, my uh, if if I can add, yeah, I would please, say absolutely. that if society, if the Swedish society accepts Amazon Marketplace as the new trend for purchasing, um, absolutely, and it will go very smoothly in the sense that, like, it will like domino effect is very fast um, adaptation, and they have no problem with that. And it's very interesting that you brought up. Um, Whole Foods and Monopri, and we talk about like Amazon Fresh and the possibility of like integrating one of maybe the bigger um, food chain, uh, food uh, grocery store chains here with Amazon. That would be a very, um, I don't know, lucrative and, and smart uh, strategic move for Amazon because that that is the gateway, obviously, as you said, uh, to to getting more people into the business. Um, question I have uh, is uh, Amazon focuses continuously on enhancing customer experience and lowering prices along the way. What are some of the ways a brand or a business selling goods on the marketplace, how do they translate value for money to the consumer? That's a great question, Nicole. So I think, uh, as I mentioned, Amazon should not be taken by any stroke of imagination as a static market. So if you really look at Amazon as a static marketplace, the, what, I, what I mean by static marketplace in the sense that you launch a product and you think that you can, that can sort of continue selling forever. Uh, I think uh, you, are, you are just sort of fooling yourself. So from that perspective, Amazon is one, a great selling marketplace, but the other part which I would sort of request everyone to consider, Amazon is a tremendous research opportunity as well. It provides a tremendous amount of information if you really have those structural parts set up in terms of very, very simple things, right? Can you find out as to what are the type of consumers you are getting from Amazon? What are the different product searches which are really happening on Amazon? What are, what are some of those unique dynamics of the, the buyer on Amazon? And I would, I would strongly urge all the attendees who really are selling on Amazon to think of Amazon as a strong research hub as well. That's, I think, my first part. The second part, I can't really overemphasize the importance of innovation. And I'm saying that we work with a lot of Amazon customers, uh, again, in the US and primarily UK, Germany, and uh, some of, the, some of the, the, the Western European countries. And the, the companies who have been successful, they are very nimble. They are constantly moving, Nicole. 
and you have to really keep on innovating and sort of figuring out as to what are the dynamics and keep on really iterating and enhancing your product offering and that is a good thing that is a good thing primarily because your consumer really expects and demands that you constantly keep on raising the bar right raising the quality bar raising the experience bar etc cetera, etc cetera. which i think the successful companies that we have worked with they they really all have focused tremendously on using this research data and really doing a lot of innovations around the around these research insights great interesting uh, amazon uh, as you said does amazon have potential as a profit generator or maybe only as a revenue generator so that's where i would uh, that's a great question first of all uh, i think uh, it de- it depends on you essentially it doesn't depend on amazon amazon is an open marketplace right let us for a moment remove the name amazon it's a marketplace it's an open ecosystem and it's a very very compelling value proposition and ecosystem primarily because i mean you can really sell and buy products on amazon or the marketplace now my question to you is what is your expectation from the marketplace and i think uh, uh, i sort of will sort of get back to what i mentioned last last webinar as well you really have to look at it whether you want to put the marketplace as a part of your strategic mix or a tactical mix we would highly recommend it a tactical mix and the moment you really look at a tactical mix you ask a fundamental question what do you want this tactic to do for you do you want this tactic to really drive you new customers as a result of which are you really focusing only on revenue or are you really looking at sharing or selling unique products whereby your margins are higher and you are able to really get a very unique type of customer which is difficult for you to really get directly on your web store so the the, the answer essentially lies on you and your overall strategic plan and the strategic intent what exactly do you really want to utilize the marketplace is that it is not an amazon question it is entirely your question i would think Hmm, great. Uh, one more question sure. in terms of with the tactics and the Hofstede model. Is it necessary for brands to adjust product profiles for each country based on consumer cultures? That's actually a great question. Uh, and the answer is 100% yes. Because if you think you can have the same product profile and the product description, and let us say, uh, as you have in Sweden, as you probably would have in Spain or Italy, uh, I think the it still would exist and it will still do well but it can do even better if you really customize or personalize is based on the the the, the very specific cultural nuances of the countries as well uh, again i would strongly recommend and we are very research focused at netflix so I, i would strongly recommend that there is a research unit which is constantly testing all of these the customer that you are winning in spain how different is it from the customer that you are winning in sweden how different is it compared to a customer you are winning in germany and so on and use that to constantly keep on tweaking your product profile essentially that you have on amazon but uh, the answer is nicole the short answer is 100% yes you really need to localize as we call it uh, localize and personalize the customer uh, the, yeah profile very clear okay well that pretty much wraps up our last webinar uh, i want to thank you thank you, thank so you very much. much nicole i'll just sort of share i mean uh, we had uh, we have been storing a lot of the, uh, the the powerful insights that we have shared over the last three webinars uh, and you can access uh, access that using our knowledge library link uh, also if you have any questions regarding netflix here and how can it really help you uh, extend and really extend globally uh, feel free to contact my colleagues ida and jaydeep and they'll be more than happy to help you i really wanted to thank all of you this is our first webinar series in sweden and understandably with his first webinar series there was a lot of anticipation and a lot of excitement uh, and i am really really overwhelmed with the support that we have really got from you so thank you very much from team netflix and we really look forward to continuing this conversation in the future thank you very much thank you